Hi, I'm Mark Washacek. Uh, I'm a retired area resource conservationist from Brookings, South Dakota. I'm currently a contractor for the NRCS and I am the primary developer of the Windbreak Workbook. It uses the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service Windbreak Standard and Technical Notes as its basis. NRCS and its Plant Materials Center in Bismarck, North Dakota, along with South Dakota Conservation Districts, have been working with windbreaks for more than 80 years. This knowledge and experience, along with the experience of other foresters in the state, are what makes the workbook a valuable resource planning tool for both windbreak establishment and renovation. The workbook is also a source of technical information helpful in developing a plan that will contain species adapted to your soil and your climate. In addition, it contains information that will assist you in maintaining the windbreak during and after establishment. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Nathan Kafer, a presenter in the tutorial. Nathan? Thank you. Yes, my name is Nathan Kafer. I am a agroforester for the state of South Dakota, Department of Ag, with the Resource Conservation Forestry Division. And through agreement with the National Resource Conservation Services and South Dakota Department of Ag, I am also the NRCS forester for the state of South Dakota. I work with local conservation districts, NRCS staff, and private landowners to utilize the windbreak workbook. It is a tool to help with designing specific windbreaks in the state of South Dakota. Next is a presenter within this workbook, Ryan Forbes. Thank you, Nathan. Like Nathan said, my name is Ryan Forbes. I am the Area Resource Conservationist of Technology in Brookings, South Dakota. I cover 22 counties in Eastern South Dakota. One of my primary tasks in my job is to help conservation planners look at our technical standards and try to figure those out when it comes to what meets the practice standard and when it comes to documentation requirements. The practice we're gonna be talking about today is uh, Windbreak Establishment 380. And with that, Mark, let's see how the workbook works. So I'd like to go through the basics of the windbreak workbook with you. And when you open the workbook up, it opens up to the menu page. And this is very uh, intuitive that we have tabs that uh, these links take you to and we'll go into a couple of them just to show you how that works. But uh, these tabs are useful for doing various uh, portions of a windbreak plan or a renovation, have lots of technical information and so on. So just to show you how that works is if I click on instructions, it'll take you to a full instructions page that goes through all the instructions uh, of the workbook. You can read them, you can refer to them uh, if needed. I won't go through them in detail here, uh, but to show you that there, there are different buttons or links on every page, and we usually we have a menu link that takes you back to the menu we were just on. We have a return button, which takes you to the previous screen you were just on. And then occasionally there's other buttons like to pop into the tools section or so on. So I'm just gonna go back to the menu in this case, and I'll jump into one more of these. Uh, the establishment uh, link takes you to a windbreak establishment. Now, if you're gonna plant a new windbreak, that's the page you wanna start on. It has the front page of the CPA 6, you can go into that here and you see you can click that link and it pops you in here and you can come back to that establishment page back to the menu either one uh, with the links there's the back page e the 6e2 uh, that has actually the rows and the species and links and so on and then it has a 6e3 which is a additional back page in case you run out of room on page two. Um, obviously then there's this order and cost list. We'll get deep into that and I'll show you the example here very soon. So I'm gonna hit the return to go back to the previous screen I was on uh, and I'm gonna go back to the establishment page and I'm gonna go back to the menu. Um, 
where I was. And I will go uh, just to show you, you a couple other things here. There's the renovation tab link. Technical information has a ton of things on it. We'll go through that uh, more in detail, but for design, technical notes, fact sheets, uh, general information, videos, it's got a ton of uh, information there for you. Um, so that, oh, I'd like to also add that the, there's a link to the to this video that you're watching here now in case you want to watch it again as you open this up. And there's also um, a link to our NRCS's website that where you can get the latest version of the South Dakota CPA 6, the Windbreak Workbook. And so you just click on that and you would download the latest version if you think your version is out of date. So that's a quick overview of the spreadsheet and the, the basic uh, uh, places that you can move with the different links and so on. data entry example that I'm going to show you is going to be very useful as you learn how to enter your data into the spreadsheet for establishment uh, windbreaks. So I'm going to open up, I'm going to show you how that works. Open up the tool and if I go to the establishment tab, there is a shortcut here to the example of the South Dakota CPA 6E2. And Showing this, I think, will help you understand the easiest, simplest, quickest way to enter your data, and it works really well. Uh, it looks complicated. It's not. I put in here um, these notes, and I've numbered them. And if you follow the order of the numbers as you enter your data, this will go real fast and easy. And when I'm done showing you the example page here, we'll do a real quick windbreak and show you how easy that is. But the first thing you would put in is your site number and it says number one. So that's your site number. It would be the first thing you put in. The second thing you'd put in is the conservation tree and shrub group. And you'll notice that the cell is white and the other cells below it are green. There's a purpose to that. White cells don't have uh, formulas in them. Green cells have formulas in them. I've kept the spreadsheet unlocked so that you can overwrite the formulas if needed, but they make the data entry so much faster and easier. Uh, if once you do a few, plan a few windbreaks, you'll notice that generally the conservation tree and shrub group is the same for the entire belt that you're planning. So this just simply repeats it throughout the entire belt. But to get back to the order in which you put these in, you would put your site number in, then you put your conservation tree and shrub group in, and then you would put your isolation width in. So you're moving left to right, but then you'll skip over right away the between the row spacing and you'll number your rows one that's number four there you'll see in the comment five six so you put one two three four five six you put your row numbers in when you have those entered then you'll come back and put your between the row width in and it will auto populate the rest of the belt for you okay so that's that simple then next thing you'll do is you'll put your first species in, then your second species in, and third, and so on, until you have your belt uh, populated with the species names. The button here as we move left to right, this checkbox can show you uh, with a green check mark whether these species are adapted to your conservation tree and shrub group. The two things that you need to make sure that you have on, turned on or filled in, is you need to have that check mark checked, you need to have a tree and shrub group entered, and you need to have an MLRA entered, okay? And this new version of the spreadsheet lets you click a button, uh, and I'll show you that in a moment, 
where you can then enter the MLRA right here. Generally, the MLRA gets entered on the very first page, the 6E1, as you fill out the, the main page of the uh, South Dakota CPA 6. So we'll go through that in a minute when we make our quick uh, windbreak example up. So moving, moving on, so I've got a checkbox here that if I have the top one checked, it means that these species in this column will be alternated with the species uh, next to it. So here, for example, honey, lost, honey locust will get alternated with hackberry. And calculation-wise, what that means is this row planned for 1,000 feet will have 500 feet of hackberry and 500 feet of honey locust. It's split right down the middle, 500, 500. So you wouldn't have to plant every other tree as hackberry. You could plant five honey locusts and five hackberry and so on and so forth throughout that row. But it does calculate that half of the trees will be hackberry and half of, of them will be honey locust. So that's the way that calculates it out. This is the full length of the row, the feet. So the next thing you, and in addition to that, if I don't have that box checked and I check the bottom box, then I can use this spreadsheet in a different way. I can only use it one of the two ways, not both. But if I check the bottom box, then that means what's ever in this column got applied as opposed to what was planned. So in th what this would mean is in, we, ran, we didn't have the honey locust, but we substituted them with hackberry, and so hackberry actually got applied in row three for a thousand feet. So I don't have to use this column at all if I'm not going to alternate or use it as a record of application. Um, but in this case, we're going to, in this example, we're going to say they were alternated uh, with these different species. So the next thing you put in is your feet. It defaults to that number of feet throughout the rest of the belt. You can, however, overwrite these formulas and put in uh, a different number of feet. If you had the last three rows were 100 feet longer, so you could type in 1100, 1100, 1100. So you can overtype uh, the formulas. Once you overtype a formula, formula is gone. So you won't, it won't recalculate anything based on uh, a formula. It will be 1100 feet is what's recorded in there. Uh, it does the calculation on the rods. You don't have to do anything with that. It does the calculation on the feet. It takes 1,000 divided by four feet apart, and you'll need about 250 plants. With the fabric, tree tubes, and seed seedling source, you can enter data there because they're white the cells, and so you'd either say yes or no. And if you say yes, if you say yes, then the spreadsheet will calculate that you need a thousand feet of fabric on that row. I have the example locked up so I can't enter data into it. That's why we got that uh, message there. Tree tubes is the same way. You can say yes or no. And the yes, it calculates tree tubes. And when you apply them, you can get a number of tree tubes apply, applied. Um, yeah, or you can type over those numbers if you're if you sell more, whatever. Um, then when it comes time to application, you would put in your isolation row, actually what was applied. In this case, what was planned was 14 foot, and actually what was applied was 14 foot. And in this example, I did the same with the spacing. I used uh, the same numbers as what was planned. You would actually measure that out and put the, the measured numbers in. Um, here, the approximate spacing in row does change a little bit from what was planned. Here it was planned for six feet. It ended up being five feet when we actually got them planted. And so it gives you a little different number on the number of trees uh, applied than it does calculating the number of trees that were planned. Uh, so you, you can put in the approximate spacing. You can measure, I used to measure a few uh, between the trees 
and I measure enough to get some kind of a statistical uh, number that I could count on and then say measure. Uh, there's 500 trees. I would measure between uh, them, 5% of them, and that usually would give me a, the average of that number between each tree would give me a, a relatively good number of how far apart they got planted on the average. The length in feet might be different than what was planned, so you can put that in. It will default then to that number above uh, on the rest of the belt, but you can type over that number if each row is different. It calculates the rods, it calculates the feet of fabric based on the feet of the length of the row. And it'll, if you turn this check mark on, it will actually tell you how many tree tubes because that calculates based on the number of trees. And it'll calculate based on the number uh, of plants that were in that row based on the feet applied and the row spacing. So that's a quick overview of uh, how to enter your data. Then, of course, this will give you totals of feet and rods and approximate plants planned and fabric feet planned and so on. So that's real handy in your planning. The acres planted, just to show you how that is calculated real quick, is so I drew up a little chart here just to show you. What it does is it looks at the isolation being 10 feet wide and then half of the 14 feet spacing between rows. So really this is 10 feet and 7 feet and that's what this formula comes up with. 10 plus half of 14 times a thousand feet long. If the belt was a thousand feet long, that row is a thousand feet long. That would give you a number of square feet. 17,000 a matter of fact. And it does that for each uh, row and each side of each row gives you a square feet number, adds all the square feet up and divides by 43, 516 gives you a total acres. So that shows you what the calculation, how the acres are calculated in, uh, in this spreadsheet. So let's um, do an example, uh, a quick data entry example, uh, after I show you just a couple of other things. If you were doing a uh, twin row high density, here's an example of how to do that. You always have between belts, you have to skip two rows, then start your next row with an isolation, and it's the same process as above, your site number, your tree and shrub group, your isolation, then your row numbers, your then you come back and put your spacing in. So with a high, twin row high density, you'd have a, a small distance between trees, and then you'd have a much larger distance between that twin row. Then you'd have a twin row again with a small distance between. And so you can see how you would set up the twin row high density data entry in the spreadsheet. Um, and then a single row, that's pretty easy to figure out. You'd only have uh, isolation. You wouldn't have a between the row spacing. There is no between the rows. So that's the way all that works. Um, and with that, we'll do a, a quick three row example next. Complete a three row example to demonstrate uh, how easy it is to use the spreadsheet and how an windbreak establishment uh, data entry works. So you go to the establishment and to be honest with you, I won't fill out the front page of the 6E. Uh, you would normally want to do that. But in my example, I just want to show you that there are two spots that carry over from the 6E and one's the MLRA. So you do want to tell it uh, what MLRA you're in. You can uh, be in any one in South Dakota here and I happen to have chosen 102A because that's the one I'm in uh, today. And secondly, if you enter 
Oops, excuse me. If you enter the section township and range up here, it carries over also. So we're in section three, uh, making this up 112.54. I don't, that's a record keeping thing. But if you, those are the two things, that line there that carries over to the six, CPA uh, 6E2. So I'm going to go back to the establishment page and go into the 6E2. I can also just click the tabs down here and move around. So you'll see that ML, MLRA 102A came in here, okay? And I'll just show you quick at the bottom, section three of 112.54 came in here. So just to show you that quick. So let's get started, let's move through here. Site number one happens to already be populated. I, I leave that populated when I start. Conservation tree and shrub group. You can get this from uh, Web Soil Survey. And we've got another video that shows you how to do that. I believe Ryan Forbes is creating that. So I'm going to say I'm in Windbreak Suitability Group 3 here. My isolation is uh, 16 feet. And remember, as I walked through, I told you the next one you want to enter is a row number. So I'm going to do a three row windbreak, one, two, and three. Well, then that this cell popped white, and so now I'm going to put the between the row spaces, spacing, excuse me, is four or 14. So now it automatically populated, you know, the, the bottom isolation, the second between the row spacing. It does things for you to speed up your planning. So now I'm going to put uh, some species in here. If I click up above this bar, it jumps up one screen at a time. So if I'm looking for something, I can move through them pretty fast. I know I'm looking for amber choke cherry. And so I'm going to get up here and there's the species I want. My second row uh, is going to be Manchurian crab apple. I don't pay so much attention to um, the species I put in here, but because I'm just showing how data entry works more than anything. I'm going to do common lilac, so I know it's towards the top. So there's common lilac. I am. I want this button checked so I can see if they are recommended for 102A in Windbreak Suitability Group 3, and I'm good on all of them. So. I'm confident that the, these species are the right species that will grow. So when I get over here, I actually want to alternate one of these. So I'm going to check the top box. Here's a little reminder about, you know, what that box checking does for you. Uh, the, the red triangles always give you information, give you tips, help you with uh, making decisions and so on. Okay, so I will only want to alternate on the lilac row in my example, I want to uh, uh, do late lilac, okay? So I'm going to alternate common lilac with late lilac. All right, so I'm, I've already set up most of this. Um, I'm going to say that this is six feet apart, that the Manchurian crab apple is eight feet apart and six feet apart. So the length, of row is a thousand feet, and that'll fill all this in for me, fill all this in for me. Fabric, nope, I'm not gonna do it. I don't even have to put no in. If I don't put anything in, it knows no. But for an example, I'm gonna say yes on the tree tubes on the Manchurian crab apple. Okay, so I've created my plan. It's got its totals down here, 1.38 acres planned. It actually has the section carried over. And what I can do is, if, if this is just a rectangular windbreak and it's site one, I can just pull, pull this up and I can put it where I want to show the planters where the site is. Okay, that's what this is all about. Uh, I also would wanna put in the producers. Um, it, it'll carry over the name from the first page. I forgot it does. Uh, some other things from the first page. Brings over the planting type, the site prep that you put in there, the program and the practice number. So it does bring over quite a few things. What you'd want to fill in here is the producer's address, uh, the address of the site if necessary, 
Um, that can be useful if you use Google Maps to find um, a address, that type of thing, and the phone home and work and the cell phone number. Enter all that to be helpful uh, for your tree planting crew. When it gets applied, you want to put in when it got applied, uh, who, who did the work, um, when the fabric was completed, and who did the work. So yeah, that's the basics of the back page, uh, second page, and how fast it can be filled in. I'll just quickly fill in uh, to put in the same uh, numbers as I had planned, just to show you that uh, in the row spacing, I'm going to say is the same six, eight, and six. And so I should really, 1,000 feet, get the same numbers over here as, and I want to see how many tree tubes I need. So there's 125. So, so I should get the same numbers on the applied as I do on the planned. And I do uh, get the same numbers. The the plan doesn't give you the number of, it does give you the number of plants. When you alternate plants, it's got to make a division. It's got to decide if it's um, 59 or 58. Well, so that's why those two numbers are one off. Um, that is it for the quick um, tour of how you put in a three-row windbreak real fast in the windbreak workbook. Um, I want to make sure I covered everything. I showed you how the acres are calculated, the totals, how the totals go to the page one. So at the bottom, it will give you the acres planned, acres applied, feet of windbreak applied. That is the length of the wind of the wind break, not the number. If if you have five rows a thousand feet long, it's not going to give you five thousand. It's going to give you one thousand the length of the wind break itself. OK. Um, yeah, and if you run out of room on the page 6E2, you can use 6E3. That's just an extension of 6E2. So that is a, an example of how to quickly put the information in. I am going to leave that information in because I'm going to use that in an explanation when I get to the workbook maintenance section. Once you have a producer that has contacted you and is interested in planting a windbreak or a shelter belt on their property, uh, you will have to go out and visit with that producer, uh, get their objectives on, on what they want done, what they want this windbreak to do, where they want this windbreak, and any ideas on how they want the windbreak to be filled in with. You know, what tree species do they like? Do they want fabric? Um, you know, things like that. Uh, you'll then have, of course, the landowner will take you to the spot where he wants the trees. You would go out, you'd measure the belt, uh, measure the length, measure the width. Uh, in most cases, you will flag it there then, um, and sometimes you will GPS it so you can bring that late back to your, your office for uh, making a map um, so you'd have that added to their file. Uh, but once you have all that done, it's time then to take that information, bring it back to the office, sit down, and open up our, our windbreak workbook. Uh, the windbreak workbook will is a tool that can help you with designing that shelter belt for that producer. Uh, the first thing I like to do is when you open it up, you're here at the front page. Um, most of the time, our producers' uh, windbreaks are planted by the local conservation district. And if that's the case, if that is the, the case here, uh, you would want to go and scroll over until you get to prices. Open this up, and this will give you an area to fill in the prices for the conservation district. Uh, each conservation district will have different prices, uh, so you have to make sure you get the right ones in. Uh, some will cost it by rod row. In most cases, it's going to be by, uh, by foot. Uh, fill in for the shrubs, uh, fill in for the trees, and then determine when shrubs and trees start and begin. In most cases, it's going to be the six. And then you can fill in for cost per plant, cost per foot. Uh, you would then move to the fabric part. 
Um, you would uh, uh, put in, is it going to be per foot? Is it going to be per broad row? Uh, and then you have, of course, your hand plants. Is, we, are, is the producer just going to hand plant them? And then if the producer wants some tubes for those other trees. Uh, the next thing then you would go to would be the first page of the windbreak uh, sheet. Uh, this would be where you would start putting in your, your generic data, your information about this windbreak, about the producer. Uh, the first place would be your producer's name, John Hartland here. Uh, years to be planted would be in 2022. What county is that bell going to be planted in? And then, of course, the farm track or field number, if you have those available. And then what type of windbreak is this going to be? In this case, we're going to do a field windbreak. You can do a living snow fence, riparian, uh, maybe a wildlife planting. There's a farmstead windbreak. Uh, so there's multiple different types of windbreaks we can do. And then you move over to program. Program is what cost share, if any, can we get to this landowner that we might be able to help them out with planting this windbreak. Uh, you got everything from CRP, Equip, GFMP, uh, CCRP. In this case, we're just going to go with we, we got a grant for them. And then you go to your practice. Um, what, uh, you know, what practice are we using under or what practice are we going to put this belt under? In this case, it's a, it's a newly new windbreak, new shelter belt. So we're going to do a windbreak shelter belt establishment, which is a 380. The MRA, that is trees that can be utilized in our area using the uh, expected year, expected height at 20 year sheet. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to use the 120.A. If you click on it, you can change it to what your area actually is. And then, of course, soils, always put your soils down. Research concerns, what concerns are we going to be addressing? In this case, we're going to be addressing soil erosion, wind erosion. Purpose of this planting, again, why are we planting this belt for this producer? Why are we designing it? Why does this producer want the belt? Well, he wants it to... Uh, let's see here, um, maybe protect plants from wind damage. Uh, but in most cases, it's going to be uh, protecting, uh, reducing erosion from wind is usually one that uh, is what we're going to do, especially with a field wind break. Now, since it is a field wind break, we're probably going to put it in a, into crop fields. So that's where you come down here for pre present ground cover. If we're going to put it in a crop field, you must ask the landowner what chemicals were put on that field. If it was atrazine, you'd have to tell the producer then that we'd have to wait a couple of years uh, because atrazine will hold up in the soil. Most cases it's Roundup, so we're good to go. It's already dissipated within the soil by the time we are planting in late April, early May. Uh, grass fields, um, you know, those are some other spots that we have. You put that down. Once you've Determine the present ground cover, you then have to come over as following need. One of the crop fields has already been tilled, so not following is usually not needed until we are about ready to plant the, the, the trees. Uh, then a producer would come out and hit it with a disc or a rototiller to break it up so it's a little bit easier to plant. So in this case, we'll hit no. If it was grass, I'd say yes, especially if it hasn't been touched. A lot of times, too, when we get out there, we don't focus on what's above us. Uh, we don't don't see those utilities. So always look up. Um, so if there is utilities present, we're going to hit yes. We're going to make sure we stay away from those utilities. And even though this is a crop field, it has been tilled probably multiple times, I still would recommend checking your culture resources. It's always a good habit to get into. Check your culture resources just to make sure we're, we're good there. Um, so... Always, I uh, always put yes for this. So site prep needs. If we're looking at a grass field, a lot of people would do herbicide, then maybe rototill or disc. In this tape, we're doing crop. So what a lot of people would do would just do a disc. Sometimes they'll rototill as well. And then what type of planting? How are we planting these trees? Well, with the conservation district, they usually will machine plant. Uh, and in some cases, in some types of plantings, we will have hand plants. Uh, so you must click those too. And then within row, how are we controlling the weeds within the row? Well, and once again, in most cases, we go with the tree fabric that controls our weeds. And we then only have to, the producer would only have to then control the weeds within the whole 
around those trees. Uh, and then you have between rows, uh, between rows one and two, how's he controlling the weeds? How's he controlling the grass uh, in between those two rows? A lot of time they do it by mowing. So you have your mechanical, some do it by herbicide as well. And then is there gonna be tree tubes? And in the second sheet that we show you, you'll see that this will get filled in. And then are we going to have any fencing? Is there gonna be any fences out there? Are we protecting this from livestock? Uh, a simple mathematic uh, uh, equation will help you figure that out. And then always put your name, always put your date that you designed this belt. And then practice certification, this is when the, the, the planting has been done and you've actually gone out there and have uh, certified, have checked the site. You would put the date you did that in, you'd put who planted it, so what conservation district, did it meet our standards, and then put your name, your title, and the date you've done that. And then once you are out there, also you can input how did you measure it? Maybe you wheeled it, maybe we GPSed it. So, uh, and then uh, put any comments that you would see out there that maybe need to be addressed. Uh, but this is after the tree plan has been done and you've gone out here and spot checked it. But before we get to that, we actually have to design the belt. So you'll open it in the second page up to here. I've already got it down. We're only doing one site in this case. Uh, so we would then come in here and we would do what our soils was. Our soils were three. We'll put that in there. We'll do an isolation, 25. We then come over here. How many rows are we doing? There we go. And the isolation moves down and then in between rows, doing maybe 14. Once that is done, we would then have to start picking out tree species. What tree species we going to do? Nice thing about a three soil in a 102A, we are open up to a lot of tree species we can plant. So maybe we'll do hazelnut. Maybe then we'll come in here, we'll do a Kentucky coffee tree. Now we want some density out there, so let's do a, a conifer. So we'll go with the eastern red cedar. Then after that, well, you know what? We want a little aesthetic, so maybe we'll go with the elderberry. You know, this is pretty diverse, uh, but maybe we want to diversify it more. So we click a little tab up here that will be alternating with. You know, the hazelnut we're going to leave alone, but the Kentucky coffee tree, you know, we don't plant very much of it, so we're a little leery on it. So we're going to come out here and we're going to plant a uh, a tree species along with it that does well, box elder. You know, maybe the elderberry just, you know, isn't his thing, but he wants something a little bit different in there, a little bit better looking. Maybe we'll go with an auburn choke cherry. And as you notice, we've got all these green checks. That means these trees match up with this soil and will be suited to be planted within this soil. Say we change the soil, say we change this to 8K soil. All of a sudden, the tree species that we did choose will not work for this soil type anymore. So we'd have to come back through here and change them. For one instance, you know, the American hazelnut, common lilac, that works for that soil. Kentucky coffee tree, box elder doesn't work. So maybe we'd have to go with Russian olive and we, instead of alternating it, we'll just do a single roll of it. And then maybe with this here, you know, we don't have what we can do here. We still want to alternate it. So maybe we'll do choke cherry. Well, choke cherry don't work. So let's go with caragana. Well, caragana works. Well, let's see what we have to alternate that with. One of the tried and two ones that will help would be, if I can find it, silver buffalo berry. And there, now we have a, a tree plan where the trees actually match up with the soils. Um, so, but once you have all that done, you then, you're spacing in between the rows. In this case, a lot of shrubs are four to six, Russian olive are eight to 10, cedars, anything after row one, I always do 10 or more. And then your caragana, your silver buffalo, which your shrubs can go for. You then have how far you measure that. So we're going to go 900 feet and it fills it in. It shows you then how many trees we're going to need at four foot spacing at 900 feet to fill in that row and so forth and, and, and for all the other rows. 
And then say, you know, yeah, he wanted fabric. He wanted to get some fabric in here, but say, you know, the cedar. Found out that sometimes that fabric will girdle that cedar. And he doesn't want to deal with that later down, so he doesn't want fabric on the cedar, so we'll just say no. And then tubes, you know, these trees really don't need to be tubes, so we'll just say no on all those. And you're good to go. Once you've filled all this up, if you scroll down, you'll see how many feet we're looking at planting, how many broad rows we're looking at planting, how many trees we're looking at planting, and how much fabric we're looking at being used, how many feet of fabric are going to be used. And of course, that's different because we're not going to fabric row three, which is the eastern red cedar row. And then, of course, it gives you your acres as well. Once you've seen this, one thing I always recommend is to fill in your legal description for the site. And make sure you double check that because maybe you're not going to be the one that goes out there and spot checks it. And they're the person that does is going to use that legal. Well, if you have the wrong legal on there, they're going to go to a different spot and then not be able to check the site. Or if there's no legal at all, they're not going to know where they're going in the first place. So always fill in your legal. Uh, it's pretty easy. And like I said, always double check it. And then I always like to put some comments on here because you may be designing the belt, but somebody else is probably going to be planting it. So, and they might not have visited the site. So I want to give them as much information as possible. So we put fabric on all rows except for the cedar. So they know they're not going to put fabric on the cedar row. Tubes and trees in rows two. Now, if we were going with the Kentucky coffee tree or the box elder, that's what it would work. But in this case, we're not. So I'd be like tubes. Uh, one thing I'll do is tubes. Uh, so no tubes. I usually say no tubes. And then we'll go alternate trees in row four so that they know that they're going to be switching uh, trees uh, after every planting. So then you move down uh, into the address. Uh, you get the address of the producer. And then if the site is a different address, make sure you write that down. And then you would get the numbers. Cell numbers are usually the most important because those are the ones that you, they carry all along. And this was filled out from the front page. It shows us once again what type it is what site prep's being done, what type of program it's under, and what practices it is. Once that is done, you then come over here to your map location. So it shows you that we're in section 25. Now, you could take a picture of uh, an aerial photo of a site and snip it into here, but it's always best to take, uh, uh, take that photo, make it a bigger picture, and attach it to the tree plant itself. So then when somebody is looking at it, they have a large paper that shows them what you're actually looking at. In this case, what I like to do is just come down here, grab one of these, and put it in the box where the tree planting is going. So if, a, if a, somebody's looking at this and they're going to plant the, the trees, they say, okay, yeah, we're in section 25, but we're in the southeast corner of section 25. That's where the tree plants are going to go. And you can change this to, you know, maybe it's an angle planting, maybe it's an east-west planting, and so forth. So that's very nice. Once this is all done, you've gotten this, you can then go over to order list and cost estimate. This here will show you what the estimated cost for this planting would be. It shows you uh, the shrubs, how much your shrubs are gonna cost. It shows you how much your trees are gonna cost. It shows you how much it's gonna cost you for fabric and gives you an estimated total cost for that, which is great for producers. They can then see that. You can then tell them, well, you know, we're going to get you a cost share. It's going to be a 50-50 cost share, so you're going to have to pay half of this. So then they're like, okay, yep, we can budget for this and move forward. Once this is all done, once you have gotten the okay by the producer, make sure you give them a copy of this page, the second page, order list, and a map. Uh, so then they have those for their records. You would then also submit this to the Conservation District. Conservation District will then go out and, uh, like I said, eight, late April, May, plant the trees. Once the trees are planted, it's time to go out and do a spot check to, sure, to ensure that the trees and this windbreak was planted correctly. And that's what this site over here is for. So once again, your isolation, you'd measure that. 
He's still 25. You're between rows. So you'd measure between the rows. They were still 14. And then you'd measure the trees uh, between each tree for each row. So lilacs, yeah, we're still at four. Rush olives is at 10. Cedars are at 10. And the uh, alternated tree species were also at four. So you put that down. And then what feet? So yeah, you know, we had 900 feet. Let's say we got down to, to row three and you know, we, we uh, uh, landowner had a little change. He didn't want to go the full length anymore. So maybe we were only going to do 800 for rows three and four. We change that. That still gives you how many rods we've planted, how many feet. You click this. I'll give you how much feet of fabric was used. Once again, was there any tubes used? No. Nope. If there was tubes used, this would change. Then if you notice of the feet of fabric, because we're not fabricing the eastern red cedar, that's still zero but it still tells us too how many plants were planted. And then once again, you come down, shows you how many acres were planted, how many feet, how many rods, how many feet of fabric, how many plants. And then if you look on the front page, once again, it shows you how many acres was planned, how many acres was applied, how many feet of fabric was applied, how many uh, feet of windbreak was applied per row, and then tree tubes. And then also, if you went to the order list and cost estimate down here in the bottom, it would tell you how much that was actually cost. So then this would all then be filed away. It would show that you've already checked it. So then if records were being pulled, you'd have them and say, yes, I checked them on such and such date. This tree planting is good to go. They can get their cost there and you'd be perfectly fine. All right, I'm going to visit with you about the South Dakota CPA 6R1 and R2 tabs in our in your workbook that this video has been about. So where does the 6R1 tab come from? Well, it comes from the Conservation Practice 650, Windbreak Shelter Belt Renovation, which is completely different than 380 Shelter Belt Establishment. These two practices are extremely different in, on how you approach them, and how you need to do, uh, to apply them on the landscape to, uh, to make them both successful. So that being said, I'm going to show a quick PowerPoint to demonstrate the practices. All right, windbreak shelter belt renovation. It's conservation practice 650. Okay, it's located in the field office tech guide like all our conservation practices. Section four is where it's located underneath the 650 CPS conservation practice standard. Very, very different than the windbreak establishment 380. This practice can be much more difficult to get onto the landscape than 380 because you're dealing with existing trees, some trees, the roles that will be good, some that will be need to be completely removed. Maybe some type of management activity can be done with some of the roles that are there. There'll be building sites around. There'll be all kinds of issues with a windbreak establishment or windbreak renovation. By definition, you're just replacing, releasing, or removing selected trees or shrubs within these existing windbreaks. Could be adding roles or selecting some type of management you know, to revigorate some roles or do things. But at the, end, at the end of the day, your purpose is restore and enhance the original plan function of the belt. Implementation requirements. So where does the actual 6R tab that we're going to be talking about here in a little bit come from? It comes from our implementation requirements of completing the conservation practice standard. So this is how we document what's out there, what we're planning on doing, and how we sign off on the actual practice. That's where the 6R tab comes into play. The 6E tab is if you're going to plant new trees in that area. That's where you would use that tab in our workbook. Well, then Tech Note 42, 41, rather. It's located underneath this section, field office section one, underneath technical notes, underneath the Woodland Tech Note, Woodland tab. Okay, so topics covered in this are planning considerations. Like I said, there are a lot of planning considerations to deal with with these uh, farmstead windbreak renovations. Some different techniques that will be covered. 
like tree removal, replacement, thinning, pruning, and coppicing. So take a look at the Woodland Techno 41 in the field office tech guide underneath section one. Some pl key planning considerations to get this practice done. This practice could take several years, years to complete. So be very, very patient from the planner side and the producer side. What are the objectives of the practice? Most of the time, most producers do not want the entire belt gone because that's their protection. So it could be phased out over years and you gotta take that into consideration. The proper site prep must be done. It has to be done with these. So removing all the old dead debris, leveling the land out, everything needs to be done for that tree planter to go in there and plant the trees successfully straight without impeding the machine going down there and the fabric machine as well. So it has to be done. If the site is not done the right way, do not plant the trees because you'll have a disaster. I have a very detailed map right, at, right from the beginning. An aerial imagery where you can draw where these trees are at, the length, the species, uh, have everything on that map because you really, you get a snapshot in time what that's gonna look like. Make sure you get accurate links immediately when you're out there on site. You need these links because there's no way of going back and remeasuring it after the dozer comes in there and destroys all the rolls that you're taking out. There's just no way to do that. You can't measure something that's not there. So make sure you get an accurate measurement. Here's a example of what a detailed map may look like. So here, here's an example. Redozier dogwood, eastern red cedar. Row is good, 500 feet long. The dogwood roll, we're gonna do some coppicing on that one. Chinese elm, we're gonna remove and replace. There's 500 feet of that. Green ash, remove and replace. Scotch pine, remove and replace. And we have an unknown roll. We just can't tell what it is. We're gonna remove and replace that. A map like this is vital to really set what is out there so you know where you're gonna go in the future with each of these rolls and someone in the future that's going to be planting them, they can have some perspective of what it looks like from the very beginning. Because when they get out there to plant the new trees or new rows, it's going to look very, very different. Other key planting considerations, cultural resources. They are a must when it comes to shelter belt renovation. Inside these old tree belts, you're going to find old buildings, machinery, vehicles. If you can name it, you will find it in there. Is there historical significance to these things? You need to know that. That's why your cultural resource training comes into play. Work with your cultural resource, resource specialists on case-by-case -case buildings. They may ask you to take pictures. They may come out on site with you. Uh, visibility can also be an issue when you're doing your surveys. Look up. Are there existing power lines running through the existing trees? Ask the producer, is there buried power lines somewhere? Because you're gonna be in there with a dozer and cat and, and uh, digging down a little bit. So are you gonna run into any of those things? So I'll always take power lines into consideration, especially around the farm site. County zoning, are you gonna be able to plant new trees? You better have that figured out before you go in there and tear a bunch of them out. If the county isn't gonna grandfather you, be able to plant them right along that road, right along that existing farm site, a grandfather in clause or something like that. Threatened and endangered species, always something we need to consider. One particular species, like the northern long ear bat. In this practice, you're probably going to be doing some type of removal, alteration, or you're burning uh, of, of wood of the, of the trees or shrubs, right? The active season for the bat is from May 1 to October 1. So these type of activities cannot occur between those dates. So you're going to have to work with the NRCS state biologists in coordination with U.S. Fish and Wildlife to see if Fish and Wildlife can say, yes, the producer can remove the trees at the, at the end of June, that type of thing. Job approval authority also comes into play with this practice. Plan a few practices with supervision right away because this is, there is no site that is gonna be the same. Uh, 650s, they just are not a cookie cutter deal what like a 380 can be. So, do a few of them under supervision with your local district conservationist or a planner that has done these for years. Why is job approval authority needed? It's needed to certify off on the practice and I'll show you where you certify off on the practice on our 6R1 tab. 
And also remember, partners can obtain job approval authority for this practice. With that being said, let's jump into the worksheet. Here are the instructions for the form. Shows you the highlighted areas here in red and what needs to go on those blocks. So when in doubt, come back to the instructions for the 6R form or tab in this workbook. Here's the six South Dakota CPR 6R1. Make sure you fill in all the, the tabs. So we got Joe Farmer anywhere in South Dakota. I'm doing the assistance here. Could be a program, may not. Contract number, throw that in there if you know that. Make sure you got your section, township and range, and what type of uh, what type of windbreak are we doing here? Well, there's all kinds of uh, uh, livestock windbreak, living snow fence, and we're just doing a typical windbreak renovation. Renovation objective, right? That's getting back to our planning process and understanding what the objective, what the farmer or rancher or producer's objective is to fix this tree belt. What, what is going on out there? What type of methods are we going to use? Well, in my example here today, we're going to talk about roll removal and replacement and coppicing. Here's an important deal. If we're going to be planting new trees and shrubs in the planting, we're going to be using the 6E tabs, right, for establishment, getting back to 380, that type of thing. Okay. All right. So we've already went into our Woodland Tech Note 41, and we reviewed a lot of these renovations methods. In that a Woodland Tech Note 41 is going to speak to sidebound trees and shrubs, how to release those, supplemental plantings, reinforcement plantings, doing some underplantings. Roll removal, and that's what we're going to do in our example today. Thinning, pruning, and coppicing. And we're going to do some coppicing, but there's pruning and thinning as well. Natural regeneration and root pruning. So there's all kinds of different methods when it comes to renovation. Once again, a very different practice than the, the, the establishment. Location of the map. And what are we going to do for planned maintenance after our renovation is complete? We're going to put some mulch or fabric down, mowing be, uh, between the rows, and replant the dead stock if needed. We got some notes we could put down here. And here's if you have job approval authority, once the producers went out there and removed all the things that we need to do, do the, the maintenance on the rows, uh, you could sign off on the practice and meet the standards and specifications. And we have some graphics down here where you can pull that up here to the map, site one with our north arrow. All these little sevens eights nines and tens back to your directions that corresponds with those numbers so that's where those numbers are coming into play all right so let's go to two south dakota's sr2 so here's our site try to do this the best that you can once again these sites are going to be completely different they will not be the same. And more than likely, this approximate linear feet could go anywhere from 500 to 380 to 270. There could be all kinds of differences in there. But try to, to figure out what was actually planted out there. And you can go back. A lot of conservation districts will have old records, old tree plantings. They keep those over the years, and that might be a starting point to determine what's out there or just knowing your species. So have a wheeler or GPS or something out there and just try to figure out your isolation. Your isolation goes here in this space. On our example here, we figuring right around 14 foot between row spacing and our isolation. Our north row, start from north to west. Here's our, our dogwood. We figure it's right around six foot in row spacing, 500 feet. Is a row functioning? In, this, in our example, we're going to say yes, it is. And our method of renovation is going to be some coppicing. Okay, so we're going to go out there. Red Dozier dogwood is a great species to do this. I've done this in the past where you cut them off really early, late winter, early in the spring, not all the way down to the ground, and they will re sprout and come up. And it, uh, a couple of years, it looks like a brand new roll of red Dozier dogwood. Row two, eastern red cedar, right around 10 feet, 500 feet long. We're not going to do anything with this particular roll because it's pretty good shape yet. And we're not going to put it on our South Dakota CPA 6E form 
here on our establishment because we're not planting a new row there. Chinese elm, we're going to take that one completely out. There's only a few of them left in there. And we're going to plan this particular row on our new plan. Green ash, same thing, just a few of them left. And we're going to plan that on our new plan. Scotch pine, the row's completely gone, but the one that we that are, are out there, we can see they're right around 15 feet, about 500 feet again. The row's not functioning, and we're going to remove it. So you do have different options in here of what you want to do. So maybe you want to thin this row, thinning for future, underplanting. So there's all kinds of tabs in here that allow you to do what you're going to do out there. An unknown role that you can run into this a lot with these shelter belt renovations. Absolutely. If you don't know the role, you don't know the role. With an about the approximate space that it was planted, if there's a few uh, species still there, uh, the linear feet is it functioning and we're going to replace this particular role. If you need to add a list, you can come back into here. And you can add a different species, but there's a quite a few lists in there, and there's a return button to go back to where we were. If we scroll down, we'll see our approximate length, rods, and how many plants and about approximate acres. You can put some comments in here. I Went ahead and did this as the windbreak's over 40 years old. The first two rolls are still good. The rest of the rolls need to be removed. And a location map. Once again, you got some graphics that you can pull up in here. You could insert a picture into this file, a JPEG, that type of thing if you wanted to. But that map I showed you earlier in my presentation, always attach something like that to your, your uh, renovation R2 tab. So uh, people in the future know what exactly how those rolls laid in here. This uh, this information is just so vital to get this practice on the ground and planned the right way. So all these numbers here, when we pick coppicing or roll replacement, we go back to our 6R1. Those are the two things that we picked here. It automatically fills in our distances based on our linear feet. Remember, once again, you can't go remeasure this stuff, so you got to do this immediately up front. So Based off my calculations on the R2 form, I had 1,500 feet that we're going to remove. We're going to do 500 feet of coppicing out there. So that spreadsheet takes it into account from this worksheet over here and back to there. So after visiting the site and talking with the landowner and getting their objectives, you would then take all the information you've gathered from that site visit and bring it back to your office to, to work on the windbreak workbook. Now, as you work on the tree plan, you may run into an area where you might need a little bit more information, and that's where the technical informational tab comes in handy. You're able to go to the menu page down here in the bottom left and then come up here says where it says technical information or you can actually just click it here at the bottom of the tab. This then brings you to any technical information that is at your disposal. So say that you were looking at um, the species of uh, trees that can go into a specific soil. Well, you have two options on how to get that information. The first review that comes to the left here, anything on the left-hand side that is highlighted blue is within this workbook. You would then click on that area and then that would take you to what you're looking for. In this case, it was the soil. So if I was looking for uh, group three soils and trying to get a definition of that, they are in this part. Once you're done with this, you then can go to technical information and it brings you back to that single tab. Now say it was not highlighted. Say it was like we have here on Windlake Woodland Tech Note 42. It is not blue. You're not able to get to it. It's not within this workbook because it's either being updated or it's just not available in for right now. You would then go to the right hand side and that is the website in which this tech guide is found in. So there's two different ways of getting to that information. If it's within the workbook, it would be highlighted blue and on the left side. And if it's not, it would be on the right side. It's highlighted blue and you can find it within the web page. 
You can then scroll down and find all types of other information, fact sheets, informational sheets. Say you want some information on site prep, that is here as well. Tree maintenance, tree protectors. If you wanted some general information, if you wanted to know more about renovations, farmstead windbreaks, living snow breaks, living snow fences, windbreak establishments, and field windbreak, that information is here as well. We also will have the video down here, training tutorials, windbreak design examples, and so forth. You are then able to gather all the information here to make a very diverse and good windbreak for your producer. What I'd like to do now is open up the windbreak workbook and show you the workbook maintenance tab and what you can use that to do. Um, so I haven't talked about the cost estimate and order list tab yet, but I will in a moment, but I wanna show you that the vendor can enter their prices that they charge into the, into the workbook and using those prices, it will give a reasonable cost estimate and it actually will fill out an order list and you could load your truck with these with the trees uh, for that person's planting. So it's pretty helpful actually, uh, having worked with conservation districts uh, who planted the trees uh, when I was in the field, they really could like to use this type of a thing, uh, have a list of trees that could be pulled out and loaded up for particular planting. Um, so let's take a look at this quick about entering your entering the vendor's prices. So I've got about four major ways that you can put in your prices. I know di conservation districts, other vendors, they can charge a hundred different ways. So this isn't meant to be a billing sheet or anything like that when you get done. It is meant to give a general estimate. Um, so let's just go through a what you can do with this. You can do a per rod row uh, charge and you put that in here or you, you can put in a cost uh, per foot. And these two are based on if you split shrubs and trees using two different costs. So let's do the per, let's go up here and, and, and uh, well, let's look at what we've got right now. Cost is per foot. So the vendor charge is for trees and planting per foot is, I've got in here 31 cents. And you'd fill in what cells are blue. So this wants to know per foot, like we're checked here, what's your charge for trees and planting, then what's your charge for shrubs and, uh, excuse me, up here, shrubs and planting, is 62 cents, trees and planting is 31 cents, but the difference between shrubs and trees is the shrub rate's gonna be used for all plants within row spacing equal to or less than six feet. So you can edit that also. All right, now if I check cost is per rod row, the setup is the same, except it's gonna ask what's the charge for shrubs and planting per rod row, you put it in the blue cell here. Um, and charge for trees and planting per rod row. And again, what's the, the spacing uh, in feet that we're gonna use to differentiate a tree from a shrub. All right, so that's the difference between checking those two boxes. One's rod row, one's uh, per foot, and it's a separate, separate charge for shrubs, separate charge for trees. What if my, I just have one cost per plant, okay? Then I would come down to the vendor charge for all trees and shrubs. It doesn't matter if they're trees or shrubs. And planting, this is, excuse me, this one's per plant. This one down here, if I check this one is, uh, it's for all trees and shrubs, doesn't matter what they are, per foot. So those are the four different ways you can put in your charge for trees and planting, shrubs and planting, that type of thing. As you can see, I've added a section to the right that 
will help you determine your average cost of a tree per plant or per foot if you charge in different ways for different categories of trees. Let me show you an example how this would work and why you do it this way. This is definitely optional, but it may help you to get uh, a better estimate on the cost of a particular planting. So let's say that the producer came in, you designed a windbreak for them, and all of the um, CPA 6E two, one and two pages are filled out. So a, a design has been done. So you know how many trees are going to be planted, you know how many feet are going to be planted, and so on. But let's say you're the vendor the district or another vendor charges differently for conifers and for deciduous trees to plant. The way this works is if you're charging either is by per plant or by per foot, you check one of these boxes and we'll just use per foot uh, this time. That seems like a fairly common way to do it. And instead of 0.37 as our cost, let's say that in this particular tree plan, we plan to plant 4,000 feet of conifers at a price of 50 cents each. And we're going to plant 8,000 feet of deciduous trees and shrubs. And our price that we charge for those are 45 cents each. So what this does is calculates the average cost of all of the trees per foot and gives you the answer here and wants you to enter that value here. Now when you go to the cost estimate and loading form, it will be using this cost for each foot that's being planted and it'll be a more accurate cost estimate. So I just wanted to show you that part, uh, new part that I've added recently, and hopefully that might help you uh, if your district or your vendor charges uh, that way. All right, you can also come down here and charge per rod or per foot for fabric and put in your number in the blue cell, cost per uh, foot or rod row for fat, I said that fabric, and then how much you, you charge for hand plants and trees, tube stakes and insulation. There's a place to put a charge for that. So with all of that, I'm gonna go back, I guess, and put it the way I had it set up because I got numbers in there. And we're gonna charge by the foot, but we're gonna charge different for shrubs and trees. And when you're all done putting in that information, you can go back to your menu or workbook maintenance section. So yeah, that's how you make changes in that. Um, so let's go back to our example. And we had, remember, put in, um, whoops, I'm on renovation. I want to be on establishment. We put in this small three row windbreak. We said how many trees were planned. We said what was applied, if you remember that. So let's go over to the order list and cost estimate just to see how this works. We have our costs in now and we have feet equal to or less in spacing. Uh, how many feet of shrubs and planting were planned? How many feet of trees and planting were planned? and what the cost per unit is, that comes right from the information we just put in. Here's the estimated cost, okay? Then also it gives you an estimated cost for fabric, tree tubes, and hand plants. Totals it up, uh, tells you the acres that are planned, total feet planned, and planned cost of tree shrubs and planting. And then it gives you a cost per foot average of this whole thing, 51 cents. Um, then there's a section for applied, does goes through the same kind of calculations and tell you what, because sometimes applied is different than planned. So let's just uh, look at how this works. So if I go back here and I'm going to pick out, uh, remember it split 2,000 feet of shrubs, 1,000 feet of trees. If I go back to the um, 
a place where I put prices in, and I'll just jump over to that tab, and I check that I want to just do cost is per foot, okay? And it's 37 cents per foot. And I go back to my cost list, cost estimate and list. Now there's only one line in here, 3,000 feet, 37 cents, and there's my estimate. So that's how this changes depending on what uh, prices that you put in, okay? Um, show you one other quick thing here. So, oops, um, uh, let me go back to this and show you that, remember we alternated common lilac and late lilac? So I need half of each tree, 84 trees uh, in my planning uh, for each because the entire length of the row uh, is split half lilac, half half common lilac, half late lilac. So let's go back and and look at the 6-2-E and say, what if I didn't have that alternated with? And I was just using this column as applied. I Instead of common lilac, I applied late lilac. Okay, how would that look on my uh, order list? Okay, well, it's going to tell you to load up 167 common lilac in the, because that's what was planned. But when we get to applied, it actually applied 167 late lilac. So that's how that uh, understands the difference between applied versus alternated with and so on in, in this sheet. Okay. Um, so I want to show you another thing. Let's go back to the menu here. Let's go back to workbook maintenance. Let's change a species name. Edit species list for establishment. So here's the establishment list. Okay, establishment list. Here's a renovation list. You might want different trees in your renovation list. Why? Because renovation deals only with what was there. What are, what belt are we renovating? What was in belt? What was in row one? What was in row two? So maybe Chinese elm was in row four. Well, we'll never have Chinese elm planted in our establishment trees. So that's why the two lists might be different. But let's say. Uh, kind of common over in eastern South Dakota, we'd like to have uh, Meyer spruce. In my list, in my drop down list to select from to be planted. You can get a variance for that. We generally have in the past. So you must click this before you uh, get done uh, with this sheet. Shoots you back into the 6E2. If I wanted to add another species, uh, well, is Meyer spruce in my list? Actually, there it is. Meyer spruce is now on my list. But I must say one thing to you is it's going to give you a red X. Why is it going to give you a red X? Because we never told it what conservation tree and shrub group it's um, suited for and what MLRAs it's suited for. So it doesn't know. So any that you add or change the name on are going to have red X's. And if you do a lot of that, you may not even want to have this turned on because it doesn't really reflect the, the true answer. Personally, I'd leave it on knowing that Meyer Spruce gives me a red X. That's kind of a, a, a bit of a, a reminder that, hey, this one isn't currently on the list. What list am I talking about? I'm talking about the, um, let's see, 20 year height of recommended species. So you would not find Meyer spruce on this list of tall trees, and that would be an evergreen at the bottom here. Meyer spruce is not on the list. It hasn't been added by NRCS at this point. I assume it eventually will, um, but right now it hasn't. So that's how that works. I'm looking, let's see. Renovation list. Uh, anything you add 
will end up on the renovation um, drop down works the same way okay but it doesn't check to see if that was uh, recommended because we're not looking at that we're just putting down what species are in those old rows that we're going to renovate The next section we're going to cover in our training today is about the tool button. So when Mark designed this spreadsheet, about every single tab when you go through this, you'll notice that this tool button is here. So it really doesn't matter what tab, I guess, if you will, you go into, you can always pull up this tool thing. I guess I always stick with the instructions page when I'm trying to get to the tool. Well, let's just go through a quick, quick some of these features on this tool button. So we have a print and save, which is pretty self-explanatory. So you can print. Nice thing about this print option, what he put in here is that you can print a couple different pages of the uh, of the 6E or all three pages of the 6R that we covered in this uh, video. Cost order document or document uh, estimate the, and the example that Mark has put into the spreadsheet as well. So a couple different options and you just hit the print button and it'll go through. Save to file. So you can save this to file. Save it to your computer, uh, save it to a jump drive, do whatever that you want with that. Okay, so this is a, uh, uh, these uh, worksheets here, South Dakota or the recommended species, the height of 20 years. So these worksheets are, are put in here so you're able to look up the species and then look at through the, the soils and that. So when you're designing your tree establishment, um, you know what it's, uh, what, what uh, soils that the trees are gonna be and at what height they're gonna be at 20 years and the height of maturity and all those type of things. And you have it for East, Eastern South Dakota, East Central and Western South Dakota. Edit, edit prices. So you can go in here uh, if you want to edit this for your conservation district. If they do it by rod roll, if they do it by trees or shrubs, you can go in here and put the, the, the prices in here for a, an estimate for the producer. Same thing with uh, the cost order estimate here. You can come in here and it'll give you all your, your estimate and you'll be able to print that off for the producer. Some more design stuff. A lot of this stuff comes out of the Woodland Techno 42 arrangements. So when you're designing your belt, it's just a quick tab to go down through some information in here about the roll arrangements and all those type of things and how it should look, your spacing um, and, all, and uh, uh, densities and things of that nature. Setbacks, there's a map in here, kind of a diagram. Uh, this is more of a farm site, I guess, if you will. It talks about secondary windbreaks, primary windbreaks, and that, and distance and setbacks, and, and all that. Nice diagram for an example. The example that Mark's put into here. So you can see how it's supposed to look. So you make sure you get everything in the right spaces and columns and all the drop downs. The tree shrub groups. This goes through what each one of the groups can do and what is the issue with each of these groups. Some good information there. And then of course the video. So this is uh, the, obviously the video that we're working on right now isn't in here yet, but it'll be down here. Um, it'll have uh, Mark's part, uh, my part, and then Nathan's part. And Mark will break this out into sections. So you just will be able to click on different sections on this. So you don't have to watch the whole thing if you just want to watch uh, bits and pieces of it. Thank you for watching this video about the windbreak workbook. We hope it was valuable information and that it will help you be able to figure out how to write a tree plan effectively and efficiently. Our contact information will be in the next slide.
Thanks again.